Welcome to the Founders Lounge, where we give you a real inside look on what it's like to lead a nationwide brand without all the glitz, the glamour, and all the hype, as well as candid conversations with other founders and business owners alike. Welcome back to the Founders Lounge. I'm Don. I'm John. The handsome fellow sitting next to me is not my redheaded wife, as many of you on YouTube will <laughs> soon find out. Um, first interview of the Founders Lounge. I like it. We'll see how this goes. I don't really yeah. know. We've never yeah. done one on this one before. Um, but before we jump into this episode, um, I wanted to ask you guys for a small favor. We don't do a lot of marketing for the podcast, and I hate doing these sort of things, but if you don't mind, would you please, if you enjoy the show, just share it on your social media. Um, word, about, word of mouth is the best sort of... Uh, promotion and advertising i guess you could say that we do absolutely um, we don't really spend a lot of money the podcast for us is sort of a a branding thing with clean eats that we like to do and we like to have cool guests on the show and you know which is is kind of re the reason why i brought you in today um you know we we kind of rebranded clean truth into into the founders lounge we did that for a couple different reasons but um i know i knew that i eventually wanted to bring guests on and interview them about how they founded their business. And, um, you know, you and I were sitting around our kitchen last night bullshitting and we started talking about your show and how you founded it and how you got it going. And I didn't really tell you, but when you were talking to me, I'm like, holy fuck, man. Like, and then, uh, you know, we parted ways and went to sleep and, and I went there and I was laying in bed and I thought about what you said and I'm like, fuck, that'd be a good podcast. Like you need to tell that story because yeah. especially this day and age, when YouTube is exploding, social media is going crazy, you know, photography and videography and, and all of this stuff that these two nerds behind us like to do. And just kidding, guys. But, um, you know, all of this stuff is, is getting very, very rampant and, and popular. And it's all cool. It's awesome. Sure. But it's just like anything else. If you don't put the time in and the work and the sacrifice it's never going to happen. It's never going to go anywhere. And I think that there's a lot of young kids out there that think that they can go buy a, an expensive camera like these guys got, start a YouTube page, and make a million bucks. Right. That's absolutely possible. Yeah. That's not, that's not an extreme statement by any means. Yeah. But I think they're forgetting about the hard times that it takes to actually get there and the work that it takes. Yeah. Your story last night, if, if that doesn't prove it, man, I don't know what does. So. Yeah. We uh, we interviewed you and we had you on the Clean Truth. Mm -hmm. That was more or less getting to know John the Hunter. The sure uh, the um, what was the show called? You changed the name of the show. And we'll talk about that. But yeah. uh, that was introducing you in the show, I think. But today, I want to talk about Primal Divide and how you started the, the business that you run, mm -hmm. um, and and basically the story that you told me last night. But, sure. You know, for those of you that missed the show, go back and listen to that one. But, you know, just kind of, I guess, give a quick background story on on yourself, and then we'll get into to your business. Yeah, so um, grew up in central Kentucky. And, and at that time, uh, age of myself, I'm f almost 45, we didn't really have whitetail deer at all. So my dad fished. I didn't really grow up hunting, and, and I didn't get into hunting late until I was probably 21, 22. Um, and even when I did, it was kind of more just that weekend thing. It was something to do during rifle season. I wasn't really into bow hunting. Um, once I turned to bow hunting, then that's kind of like that little switch. You know, it, it flipped, and um, it, it got more intimate, you know, with hunting. You know, you're getting in closer, and it became more of a lifestyle than just something I did during hunting season. Still yet, you know, I was a police officer and I was doing narcotics back home. I had a landscape company that I ran on the side. I drove a race car a little bit, you know, professionally, but it was never going to be anything that was going to be a career. Um, I see these guys on TV and I thought, man, there's just no way that'll ever happen. But it would be cool if it, if it did at some point, you know, but um, I ended up getting involved with a company called Wicked Tree Gear. And still today, the product is sold in Cabela's, Bass Pro, Field and & Stream. And I remember going to my first meeting with Cabela's, and they're throwing out all these acronyms. Um, and I just looked at them and said, I have no idea what you just said. 
Like I know I have a good product, but I don't know how to get a product into a big box store. Sure. I don't understand distribution centers and hubs and POs. And, and I remember those meetings very yeah. well. And I'm like, I have no idea what I'm doing. Normally they would just bounce people out of those meetings and everybody thought it was kind of funny that I was that genuine. I didn't try to bullshit them. I just didn't know. Uh, so they took it's the intimidating time. Too. Yeah. Oh yeah. It was really intimidating. Um, we ended up landing all of those accounts and, and, and they coached me through it and in trial by fire and my business partner, he had a hunting show at the time and I became a field producer again, never thought I would ever film a hunt. I hunted to hunt and started doing that with him and enjoyed like the whole storytelling aspect of the whole deal. And, you know, you fast forward the companies, both companies are growing very, very fast. Um, I started doing some content creation, but just for the show, not for me. I didn't even, I still at that time didn't even have any social media for myself. We ended up selling Wicked Tree Gear and that's kind of when it was transition time. It was time that I said, I'm going to leave law enforcement just four years shy of a full medical, uh, you know, pension, but I wanted to do something for me. And so I said, all right, here's the deal. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this leap of faith. I'm going to move to Iowa. I had a three-year contract with the company that I had sold to. And I thought, I got three years to figure this shit out. Now, hold on. For the people that don't understand what you're talking about, you sold that company to, was it private equity? Yep, yep. So a holdings company with a lot of money came in and bought it. Correct. And then put you back on an employment retainer for three years. Correct. Now, yep. did you have any equity still? No. No ownership whatsoever? No, I had no no equity left in the company and had a three-year contract um, to continue the, the remainder of this buyout. Sure. Um, the problem was, is just a couple days shy of the final payout, they decided to close the company, um, which left me... At zero dollars, um, no money coming in, and at this point, I was committed to tractor payments and side by side payments and RV payments, and you know I was living life like any Joe Dirt would that was making a bunch of money, you know, at, at one time. And um, the only thing I had was I had a I had a DSLR, I had one lens at the time, and I thought. Man, I'm careful. These guys are going to get excited yeah. and start talking to him. Like yeah. That. So I said, I'm, I'm living in Southeast Iowa. Um, no offense to the area, but there's not a lot of jobs in Southeast Iowa that I could have gone to, to make what I was making, you know, at that time, of course, I'm locked into a mortgage and a land payment. So I've got to make some decisions real quick and I'm liquidating everything. I'm selling all the toys that I could very quickly and then I finally get down to where I have land house and a truck. Couldn't get rid of the truck. I was really going to lose my ass on that. And I'm going to need transportation no matter what. So now i got to try to sell this property. And there's not a lot of people, again, in that area that are buying, you know, houses that are over 4,000 square foot and have acreage and things like that. And I needed to sell it really, really fast. And mm. so this is one of those like full transparency issues. I, I ended up selling the house, um, at exactly what I owed the bank. So I guess I kind of skipped over this, all of my police pension money and all of the buyout money. I use that as my down payment on the land and the house when I bought it. So I don't have any savings. And, you know, I talk about a lot of times betting on yourself and kind of going chips all in. I was, I was pot committed at this point, you know what I mean? Um, so we ended up selling the farm around 6 p.m. was the closing time. But the following 8 a.m. the next day is when the house and land was going to be sold on the courthouse front lawn. Mm. So I was getting ready to lose everything. Um, but we ended up selling it. And we were able to get out from underneath everything um, to avoid total credit nightmare. But at the same time, I had zero dollars. So I still have zero dollars coming in, too. And I've got a wife and I've got three kids. I mean, I was like I was telling you last night, I was selling stuff on Craigslist. I was selling stuff on eBay. I mean, anything I had that wasn't bolted down 
you know, that I absolutely had to have. But I kept the DSLR and I kept a bow. And I thought, these are the only two things I got. I've got to make this work. Now you're talking about selling clothes, shoes, oh, yes. personal belongings. Oh, everything. I sold everything. Yeah. I mean, I sold uh, excess coolers. I mean, whatever I had, you know, of value. So I started selling and I made one Facebook post and just said, Hey, you know, you guys have known that I've done some content creation in the past for some brands and, um, I'm now for hire. I'm now going to be, you know, put my, put my head, you know, name in there in the free freelance world and phone started ringing and, and thank God it's kind of, it's just kept ringing ever since. And that's, that's when things got real, real serious with the show. And it wasn't, I mean, I always hunted serious, but I didn't take that business side serious until I absolutely, this is what I got to do, um, and kind of found a, a niche in it. You know, and a lot of these things that played out, I got to see a lot of media kits from other companies when I owned Wicked, and I got to see what a lot of these other hunting shows and a lot of these hunting personalities, what they were offering. And one of the things that I noticed that they weren't offering was photos and making that a large portion of their contracts. It was more of the typical, um, your product will get seen in an episode, maybe, you know, where it, where it falls in. But with me having a brand new show, I couldn't guarantee viewership. I couldn't, I couldn't promise them they'll get one view or they're going to get a million views. But what I can guarantee them is X number of photos, you know, edited high quality photos that are ready to go for their social media. And this is also when Instagram was really exploding and you've got TikTok and Snapchat and, you know, Facebook was doing what it's always done, but you're looking at all these different platforms. And I'm thinking if I was still owning a company and I was marketing my brand, I need as many as, as many photos and videos that I could possibly get my hands on. If I can post one a day, great. You know, on each platform, something different, that could be five photos a day that I need. So that was my angle, and that's what I started approaching companies with, and I got a couple of companies to bite. I was working with, uh, with Sitka Gear at the time as one of their ambassadors, and that was huge. Great opportunity, and and forever grateful for that opportunity. It gave me a, a peer to fish off of, admittedly, you know, and I was able to get a lot of other, um, a lot of other companies, you know, that, that wanted to be a part of that or co-brand, you know, on that side of the, of the fence. One of the other things that I'd skipped over is in, in 2013, um, my first big company that I sat down and had a meeting with was Under Armour. And, I didn't know who I was meeting. I didn't, you know, I was so new to hunting. I didn't know who the players were. I wasn't very connected. But a buddy of mine had actually set me up and said, hey, you've got a meeting with this guy named Kobe Folks. And he's got a big ZZ top beard, you know, former, you know, Marine, like, uh, but his brother Kip is one of the original founders of Under Armour. I thought, damn. Like I'm, that's about as high as you can go. Okay. Like I've got a meeting with a, I've got a meeting with a guy that can make some decisions. So in 2013 at the ATA, I give him my pitch and I show him some of my content that I'd produced and very nicely. He was very, very, I, I remember how he was very respectful, but he just said, Hey man, your shit's not good enough. Like it's good, but it's not good enough. I'm already paying money for the exact same shit you're trying to sell me. And I've got relationships with these people. So either A, you got to get better or B, you got to get different. And, you know, and a lot of people would have sat in that meeting and they would have been like, well, all right, whatever, screw you. I'm out. Peace, yeah. whatever. I'll go to the next company. I'll go hit up Kuyu or, you know, whatever. But that's a tough pill to swallow. It is. It is like having another, another grown man, you know, and I think I'm presenting my A game, you know, and he just tells me, hey, dude, your shit's not good enough. And obviously anybody that's in creative or in business, you know, we all put, we, you know, we think that's our best, you know, we've got, and, and I presented it that way. So I said, well, before I leave, can you tell me what I can work on? And he was floored. You know, you could tell he, he'd never, nobody had ever asked that question. Right. So he told me exactly what I needed to work on, gave me a couple of ideas and I took that stuff to heart and kind of kept that in the back of my mind. 
Now, this was 2013. Well, just this past March, you know, I signed a contract with Under Armour. And it's kind of funny how everything goes full circle. And, and even with my own kids, I hear them all the time. They're like, I'm going to bust my ass for a couple of weeks. or I'm going to bust my ass for a month. You know, if I give it my all this semester, I think I can do this. Ten years. I busted my ass for ten years before everything came full circle and Under Armour came back and offered me an athlete contract. And then just last month, we actually just signed an extension through 2025. So, and now they're taking over as the title sponsor of the show and it's just kind of cool. And, and, and it's, it's given me a great teaching thing to be able to tell that story that, yeah, sometimes things happen overnight, but it's kind of like kindling or throwing gasoline on a fire. It'll burn bright and burn hard and fast for a little while, but it goes right back out again. Um, building those foundations within the industry you know, not screwing anybody over, always being upfront and honest and trying to do the best I can with people um, and making personal relationships. I have relationships with the people of the company, not so much the product. Now, I don't want to work with garbage brands or garbage sure. products, but the people mean more to me than the product. You know, and I, I had coined a phrase a couple of years ago where I said, um, you know, like, it's, it's people first, product second, but they both better be fucking awesome. And I, that's kind of the way I've always done things, and it's, it's always, it always worked out well for me. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to summarize this to just to try to make an impact. So what year was it? You said you told me last night it was 2019. That's when things got – s- Yeah, yeah, 2019. February of 2019 – Sold the farm just so that shy was less of foreclosure. Than five years ago. Yeah, yeah, it's four or four year, yeah, four years ago, and I had six dollars and seventy eight cents. That was after I liquidated everything. Um, so yeah, four years ago, yeah, under under seven bucks, um, and and I know I, I mentioned this last night, the lowest point in all of that was my son, he wanted to go on a field trip. And you know how schools, they send home the permission slips for parents to sign so the kid can go on a field trip. But there was also a little box on the bottom that said, you know, enclose a check for $25. And I had to tell my son that he couldn't go on the field trip. Mm. So his whole class got to go on the field trip and he had to stay back because I didn't have 25 bucks. And that was the lowest point, you know, for me. And that's when I said, okay, this is going to work. I'm going to make this work because it's something I'm passionate about. I feel like I have the talent, um, but I'm simply just not going to quit. Sure. I can't. You know what I mean? It's not just me and my reputation at stake, but it's my kids. That's something that Yvonne and I talk about all the time, and that's what we call it is no plan B. No, there was never a plan no B. plan B. You had to make plan A work. Because you were all in. We did the same thing. We had no plan B. Yeah. We had no house. You know, we were driving a beat up minivan at the time. Yeah. yeah. We had almost absolutely nothing. Yep. And it was either this is going to work or we're going to go our separate ways. I'm moving back to the city and I'm going to keep swinging a hammer and, you yeah. know, you'll go start taking x rays again. You know what I mean? We yeah. Were, <laughs> that was it. That was plan B. Yeah. Well, and we, you know, my wife and I, we talked about it and it, it, you know, when we, you hit that $7 threshold and now we're talking, that's one value meal at McDonald's, you know, that's where we, where we were at. And she said, what, what are we going to do? Like, what if we, what if we were to move back to Kentucky? We could probably move back into your, the parent, your, your parents' basement. And I said, yeah, not a bad idea, but we need about $170 of gas money just to get down there. We don't even have the gas money to bail the fuck out. You know what I mean? Um, I remember one of my photo gigs that I picked up was with this gas company. They were looking for somebody to do drone work. And I was like, yeah, I'm your man. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sick with the drones. I know all of them. I'm a DJI. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm good. You didn't know shit, did you? No shit. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't even own a fucking drone. <laughs> So what I did was I bid the job at like 2500 bucks, and I said, but I need 50% deposit because I'm super booked up. 
I mean, I'm in demand. So to lock you in on these dates, I'm going to need 50% deposit. I took the 50% deposit and bought one on eBay used, got it in and had like three hours of practice and then went on the shoot and filmed this drone project That's for awesome. them. <laughs> yeah. So, and they were like, wow, you're pretty handy with that drone. I'm like, yeah, man, like I said, I'm, I'm the man. <laughs> and the whole time I'm thinking, please don't crash. Because if I crash this drone, I mean, I'm, I'm real fucked. Yeah. You know? I didn't have insurance. So in less than five years, you go from having literally $6 in your pocket yeah. to now having a, a successful YouTube outdoor show. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the show we finished at 1.7 million views this year on, on the Waypoint channel. Um, I, don't, I didn't even keep track of what it was on, on YouTube. But, um, you know, and having Under Armour as the title sponsor and, and being one of the five Under Armour athletes in the United States. I think, man, in less than five years, that's still pretty fast. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it is pretty fast. Yeah. But, I mean, just to hear your story of – where you started to where you are now in five years. I mean, people say that Yvonne and I's story is fast, and it absolutely is. Yeah. I mean, we went from flat-ass broke to, you know, having a nationwide brand in, I would say, 12 years. Yeah. And even that is astronomically fast. Yeah, for sure. But the amount of sacrifice that it took to get there is what a lot of people don't see when they look from the outside looking in. They don't see that. Well, what is it, you know, I, you see those pictures a lot of times, like with the iceberg and you just see a little bit of ice yeah. sticking up above the water, but you see like the huge iceberg under the water and, um, or no different, you, uh, a duck on the pond, you know, a, a duck looks like it's just sitting on top of the water, but underneath the water, nobody can see it. It's fucking feet are moving a mile a minute. So, you know, whenever I have, and I have buddies back home all the time, they're like, ah, it must be nice, man. Damn. You've gotten luck. You've got, you've, you've run into a lot of luck. That's annoying. Yeah. It, it's super annoying because I hear that and I'm saying, yes, there has been opportunities, but we all get opportunities. It's what you make of the opportunity Absolutely. and people think it's luck and it's not luck. I mean, it's hard ass work. I mean, there was years there where, um, my wife would freak out cause I'd sleep three hours a night. Some of it was stress and some of it was just, if everybody else is working eight hours, I'll awesome work man. 18, yeah. you know, and I was willing to do that, but failure is not an option. And it never was, like you said, with the no plan B I've never, ever had a plan B and is it reckless and dangerous? It may have been what put me in the position that I was in the first place, but everything's an exercise. So the more you go through it, the easier it gets. And even though things were grim at that time, I was never really worried. You know what I mean? Just because I simply, I had been in the outdoor space and this is not a knock on some of the other guys. Cause there's some hard ass workers out there, but I knew what the landscape was. And I knew that it, I'm a, I'm a hard ass worker that was instilled in me as a kid and I'm not going to give up. So Let's just make it work, you know. Well, I think another benefit that you have, and I'm not saying that none of them had it or have ever had it at one point, but I think what gave you the advantage is you had nothing to lose. Nothing. And I think you knew that. Oh, yeah. And that's kind of what we had. Mm -hmm. I mean, we were like, we ain't got nothing to lose. Like, yeah. This is going to work. Yeah. Because we don't have anything else. Uh-huh. And so I think that. You know, I'm not saying that people can't be successful and, you know, think of an idea and come up with a business plan and run pro formas and do all this bullshit. Yeah. That stuff works. Sure. It does, but not as good as somebody with nothing to fucking lose. No. I had nothing to lose. Like I said, not, you know, I mean, I had that one value meal in the savings account. You know, if the shit hit the fan, I had one last meal in me or whatever. But, yeah, I, I, I had nothing to lose. Um, and I tell you, you know, and it, it's funny – because I've had this question come up before and they say, but where does that constant drive come from? And you can always say, well, it was, you know, my, my kids and, and something my dad taught me or whatever. But the day in, day out, not to sound cliche, is it's always been the gym. Because if you think about it, everything we do in life, there's variables. You know, your, the cost of your raw goods for your meals, they change. The, the, you know, the plastic container, the price might change or shipping might change. But when you go to the gym, 
how much does a 45 pound plate weigh? Well, it weighs 45 pounds. It did yesterday and it will tomorrow. So having that constant in my life to be able to go in and force yourself to do that, you know, we've all heard that, you know, discipline versus motivation, just staying disciplined to it. I'm like, I just got to keep going just one foot in front of the other and hopefully it'll play out. And, and I got lucky as far as having some of those connections come my way. Um, but again, they were just introductions. I still had to do the work to, you know, to move on to the next one. But, um, I looking back on it, I mean, it sucked the same as you, like nobody likes to be that poor. Absolutely. You know? Um, but I wouldn't have it any other way because now I look at where I'm at now and, and how I appreciate things. The way I was going in life, it's not that I took things for granted, but I sure as shit didn't appreciate them then like I do now. And, you know, I was with Under Armour in Vegas and, you know, they had me come out there to hang out with them and, and you know, be in the booth and, and talk to people and there was some downtime and I was in the stock room refolding shirts and they're like, what are you doing? You're folding shirts. Yeah. What else? Why not? Like I am so fortunate to be where I'm at that I don't, I don't take any of it for granted. No, you we're know? the same way. I mean, when her and I joke about it all the time too, we're like, you know, they, they ask us about old times and I'm like, I go back tomorrow. I would go back to that wedding salon tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Because it was the process. Same thing with bodybuilding. Yeah. If you've ever competed or been a bodybuilder or anything like yeah. that, the show was terrible. Yeah, right. You know, you get to a, a show and you get on stage that day, it's fucking horrible. Nobody yeah. actually enjoys that. Yeah, right. I mean, if they do, you need your head checked. Yeah, right. It's not that fun. Yeah. You know, those days are miserable. It's the process. Mm-hmm. It's the grind and what it took to get there. And that, like you said earlier, the discipline, the day after, right yep. foot, left foot, right foot, left foot. Yep. That, to me is something that we almost miss now Mm -hmm. with our own brand because as big as we've gotten you know in the early days i mean her and i are just like one of the big things that's in our wheelhouse that her and i are really really good at is concept Mm -hmm. like we can take an idea and everybody here scott's gonna start laughing when i say this but my wife can sit in a room and come up with 50 million fucking ideas sure in an hour yeah. I mean, that's that's really our marketing meetings and it annoys the shit out of me. Mm-hmm. And I can take maybe three or four of those ideas and say, okay, out of your, you know, your la-la land, these four are really good. Yeah. Now let's fucking start developing these four. Yeah, how do we execute? But now with the brand that we have now and, the, and, and as big as we've gotten, to actually take those four ideas and conceptualize them sure. takes months and oh, yeah. months and yeah. months. Yeah. Whereas before, we used to be able to sit there, come up with an idea. All right, let's try it and do it. And if it works, yeah. great. Yeah. Like that feeling you get from that mm-hmm. is, is, I can't even describe it. Yeah. And that's what we miss. We miss those early days where we're like, shit, I don't know if this is going to work. And if it doesn't work, we just lost a lot of money that we don't have. Mm-hmm. But there was a thrill there. Yeah. I don't yeah. Know. Well, and I, I remember back when I was when I was in law enforcement, we would have new guys come in, and I the the thing that I would always tell the new kids is make a decision, right, wrong, or indifferent. But the sooner you make the decision, sure. you learn if it worked or didn't work, and then you get to reset and try another way. But if you take a week to make this damn decision now, you, and it doesn't work, you've just lost a week. You know, um, now when you're taking people to jail and carrying a gun. Maybe that's not always the best time to be so rammy, but Hey, it worked for me. Yeah. <laughs> well, not to, not to ask the typical cliche question that tends to get asked in these conversations, but what are your like long-term goals with the show other than millions and millions of views? I mean, everybody wants that, but yeah. Um, so my plan's always been to continue to diversify because a hunting show, um, who knows what the future is is going to be with that. Like I said, I'm 45. Um, how much longer can I continue to go up and down mountains the way I want to do them? And uh, I think when there's a time where I have to deviate my style, then that might change kind of you know the way I do things. Um, but once the show kind of got going, then it allowed me to start to branch off into other things. You know, I started bourbon barrel calls. 
So I have another product again, which which I've always loved. And which are great, by the way. I've used them. Love, time. love, love the business. It's a lot of fun to do. You know, taking actual Kentucky bourbon barrel heads and making them into into turkey calls. That's a lot of fun, and it, it's also cool that I don't have to pay for marketing. I can promote that product through Primal Divide. You sure. know, my own hunting show. I have Johnny Utah Creative, which is my freelance marketing uh, consulting slash product design business. So I've had opportunities to be a consultant for different companies in the outdoor space. If they're developing a product, um, I've been able to help them develop it, uh, make some tweaks on their prototypes. And that's another fun, fun business for me as well. Um, the cool parts with that is nobody's going to care how old John Mulligan is. He might not be in the best shape anymore, or I might be a 60-year-old man, and as long as that I can still come up with creative ideas and, and product design stuff, then that business still has legs and should always have a future. Um, would like to get into some, some more writing. Um, that's been an idea. And then also do more. Should write a book, man. Yeah. Yeah. The, my wife and I, we want to write a, we would love to write a book sometime and make each chapter of the book one suspect, you know, that I, that I investigated or, you know, took down in the undercover, you know, narc days. Um, is that kind of like maybe an adult version of like the Hardy boys or something like that? But we want to do something like that and, um, other products, but I'm at a point now where I'm seeing a lot of this come full circle and I have so much benefit from, Hey, Fred, I want to introduce you to my buddy, Steve. I'm not gaining anything from that, but I love seeing the power of business connections. You know, these drives that I'm on, I know I connected a couple of brands on my drive down to, uh, to Pennsylvania and had a blast doing it, you know, just seeing other people get to collab and do some, do some branding together and do some business together. Like I said, I'm not making any money off of it, but that stuff comes back around, you know, as you know, uh, those, those connections, but yeah. And obviously, like you said, you know, initially increase the views of the show. That's the driving force. Um, but me personally, outside of all business, you know, my goals, um, have never changed. It's, I don't have a fear of dying. I got over that a long time ago. I have a fear of getting to do everything I want to do before I die. So the hunts that I always look forward to the most are the negative 37 degree hunts or someplace in another country, things that people don't typically get to do. Um, <laughs> This past week, I was telling somebody about my last Saskatchewan hunt when it was negative 37, and they were like, fuck, there's no way. There's no way I would ever do that. And I quoted like that line from that movie Troy with Brad Pitt, and I'm like, and that's why no one will ever remember your name, <laughs> you know? So that's just the cool stuff for me is being able to, to do that kind of, you know, do those kind of hunts and those kind of adventures. I grew up central Kentucky. Dude, I... My map was my map of life was was already played. It was it was written in stone. I was going to take over my dad's plumbing business. Was probably never going to leave the state of Kentucky, and I was going to be okay with it. Yeah, um, I was in a similar situation, a couple yeah. hundred miles away. Yeah, exactly. So, anything I get to do, I mean, hell, I'm in North Carolina. Hell, I didn't think I'd be here. You know what I mean? Sure. I was in Pennsylvania. I was in Maryland. We're going to South Carolina tomorrow. Like. Who gets to do this kind of stuff? You know, it's awesome. Dude, I think I think the the industry that you're in, I think, is super cool. And I, it's getting it's getting bigger. It's getting bigger. There's a lot of people. It's getting bigger. It's getting saturated. It is getting a little saturated, but I just think that's kind of why I thought it was important to have this conversation. I think there's so many young people out there, and not just outdoors, yeah, but people. Period. You know, like. Even these two guys, I mean, I give them shit for being camera nerds, but, you know, I think it's it's intriguing shit. I don't know a damn thing about it. Yeah. But, I mean, it's catching on and it's, it's gaining popularity, out, you know, a lot. And I think the people that try to go and make money at it and monetize it, mm -hmm. they get a slap in the face when they realize shit. Like, 
this is going to be way harder than I thought it was. It is. Be. It's 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 tough. I mean, you know, if you're if you're living at home in mom's basement and you've got a camera, sure you can make a little money. But when you have to start, when it's on you and you have all your own expenses, um, and you're trying to navigate your way through, it's tough. I mean, I know a lot of guys that have gotten into it from the creative side, and they've made it a year or two. Um, and then, you know, that, that light fades, you know what I mean? And reality sets in like, damn. And that's where those relationships start to come into play. You know, I've been in, been in this space for so long and I know so many of the people, I mean, there's not really anybody that's a player in this space that their number's not in my phone. We might not talk all the time, but we know each other. Sure. And, um, I see some young creatives that get into the space and, Right out of the gate, they're like, I'm seven fifty a day, day rate. I'm like, I used to be zero dollars a day day rate no when kidding. I was learning. Then I made it to fifty bucks a day. Then I made it to two hundred dollars a day. Seven fifty a day? Oh, there's some guys out there pulling down some big big jack. I'm in the wrong business. Yeah. Um the problem is is how much of that can you keep doing? Sure. How many companies can afford to keep doing it? So and um I've never been one of those that like I don't want to like try to make a bunch of money on one shoot and then be like eating saltines for the next two months. I kind of like that steady. Um, but there's a lot of different ways to do it, but the cost of cameras keep going up. They're no different than computers. There's always the latest and the greatest that keeps coming out. Trust me. These guys remind me all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's um, expensive stuff, but the one thing that does help the creatives is, um, it's kind of like the five hour energy, you know, the world is go, go, go. And you can look at some of the, you know, the old videos that did well on YouTube before and the, the average length of view, you know, people would view a video. And that's why you have these Instagram reels and TikToks that are doing so good. And, you know, everybody can be a 20 second, 30 second star and that capture that person's attention sure. for that long. Um, but again, the turnover the flip side of that is something can happen. You like when we were kids, you remember something really cool that happened. You still remember it today. Oh, yeah. it's something really cool that happened a couple years ago. You forgot about it a week later because something else replaced it again. You know, we're just uh, as a society, we're consuming so much, so rapid um, that that's a scary place. You know, I had a buddy of mine. He, he says the other day, he's like, Man, you only killed 11 animals last year. He's like, it's kind of an off year. I mean, you know, 14 months ago, you killed like 17 animals that year. Now, that was a banger year. Like, so I'm not, what are you saying? I'm washed up now? You know what <laughs> I mean? <laughs> so, but it's just this constant replacement of, of stuff. But again, that plays back into the tenure. The brands that I work with, they know how long I've been working at this. They know that I'm not going anywhere. And there is an ebb and a flow of, of it all. And you just got to keep going because not every year is going to be the best year. You're hunting a wild animal. It's not predictable. Yeah. Well, man, thank you for sharing this story. I kind of wish that, you know, in, in, in the world that you live in and the things that you do now that I've have gotten back into it and I'm very familiar with that world. I wish those stories could be told from the outside looking in. Sure. Yeah. You know, because you get into, I mean, dude, the outdoor industry, just like you, it has its politics and it's bullshit, just like anything else. hundred percent. But I always say, you know, there's, I, it's not me that says it, but I do like the saying that, you know, um, don't judge anybody because you never know, where they've been and how far they've come. Mm -hmm. and so I think that, I don't know, sharing stories like that in, in new industries, I think is very, very fucking important. Yeah. So I appreciate you coming on. And well, and that's, like I said, and just like what you're saying there is it's, that's what people don't see. Cause if you can look at social media and you see all the pretty and it looks like it's so easy. And I think that's why a lot of people want to get into different Sure. You know, professions is everybody wants to paint this picture that, oh, man, I just I woke up today and yeah. first day on the mountain, I shot that elk. And, you know, I've got my sweet brand new X 
product, you know, that I'm using. Well, truth be told, the product, that company maybe only gave them a 30% discount, but they're painting a picture that they're getting paid, you know, all kinds of money. And I mean, in reality, probably 0.001% of the hunters on social media are actually making money at it. 0.0001% are actually doing it for a living. And that's what nobody sees, yeah. you know, and then nobody sees that hard work that went in for years and years and the nose that you were told or a new marketing director comes in and you get booted, you know, and you got to start from ground zero again. But um, I, I do think people need to need to understand and see that struggle that goes into even something like, you know, the hunting space. No, I agree. Well, tell people where they can find the show. And- yeah. They can uh, find uh, the show is called Primal Divide. You can find it on the Waypoint channel, which is a native channel on Sling TV and Pluto, those streaming services, Amazon Fire, Samsung, Vizio. Uh, you can also download the Waypoint app if you want to just binge watch all my episodes on video on demand style. It's a free app. Um, or you can also go to YouTube. But uh, day-to-day interaction, it's johnny.utah.hunt on Instagram or Johnny Utah Hunt official on Facebook, and you can connect with me there. I only got one more question, man. What's that? For the love of God, yeah. can we please brand you a T-shirt with Gary Busey on it? Oh, yeah. You Give know, me two. Yeah. I want one so bad. <laughs> All right, man. Thank you. Appreciate it. See you next week, guys.